Everybody and happy Easter to you all. Uh, my name is Ricky Braddy and I am the music and arts director for Grace Point Church and we just want to extend a very warm welcome to everyone tuning in today. Um, we, we are based in Nashville, Tennessee, um, but we know that so many people who tune in on a weekly basis live in other states and even across the world. So we want to wish a very warm welcome to everybody who's decided to, to join us today on this beautiful Easter Sunday. And we hope that you experience the true hope and the newness of life that is found in the Easter message. If you have not subscribed to our newsletter, um, you can do that on our website, which is gracepoint.net slash subscribe. Be sure to do that. Stay up to date with what's going on in our community. And again, welcome to Easter at Grace Point. Welcome to Grace Point. We are a progressive Christian church. Loving our community by gathering in our homes. Even as we practice social distancing, we're asking big questions about what it means to be human, what it means to love our neighbors, and what it means to follow Christ. We're cultivating a safe virtual space to deconstruct or reconstruct, to question, and to grow. We are welcoming, affirming, and fully inclusive. Because who you are and who you love are celebrated here. While we may be physically apart from one another, we believe we're never truly alone. You are never alone. We're together in this. 
We're We're together. together. So even though we can't give you a hug just yet, we want you to know that you are beloved, you are included, and you are affirmed. Welcome Welcome to to Grace Point. Point. Welcome to Grace Point. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. GPK and GPY, I hope each of you is having an excellent day. I am thrilled that throughout the month of April, I will be working with the amazing Molly Brown to transition the GPYK program to Molly's Care in May. If you have any questions or need information on all that is being created for and shared with our GPYK community and friends, email myself at lisa at gracepoint.net as well as molly at gracepoint.net. GPK, you hang out every Sunday at 9 a.m. on Zoom. For information about our awesome Zoom Hangouts, check out our Instagram, at gracepointkidstn. GPY, you connect throughout the week on Discord. You gather on Discord every Sunday morning from 10.30 to 11.30 a.m. For information about the GPY Discord, check out our Instagram at gracepointyouthtn. Throughout the last seven weeks, GPYK has utilized SALT Project's Love Builds Up Family Challenge. We have grown in our awareness and ability to care for and to love one another really well. Today we observe Easter. What does that look like for you and your family? For access to the SALT Project's curriculum ebook as well as our Bitmoji classroom, check your email inbox as well as our socials. If you're not a part of our email list or our socials, email molly at gracepoint.net and myself, lisa, at gracepoint.net. All right, peace out big air hugs, and so much love to each and every one of you.
I've just got a few announcements for you all. Every single week on Sundays, we join together um, as a community about 15 minutes before the service actually starts on YouTube. Um, so at 10.30 a.m., we are able to join in a live chat and we keep up with each other, we check in on each other, love on each other, since we aren't meeting right now in person. Um, that's the best way to stay connected to the community. So we want every single person who, who tunes in to join us and introduce yourself, tell us where you're from. We'd love to know um, all about you. So be sure to do that. Um, we offer at Grace Point something we call Reconstruct, and um, that is every single Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. And we're offering a new time um, these days, which is Tuesday at 10 a.m. So two different options for Reconstruct. Um, it's an awesome time. Josh leads that usually, and it's a place to kind of bring your questions, bring um, all your doubts, anything that you're dealing with, and um, really kind of wrestle through those with, with other people in a safe space. So we, we invite you all to join us for that as well. There are several ways that you can join and partner with our mission here at Grace Point. Um, one of those ways is to give financially. And uh, we just want to say that we do appreciate um, all the generosity that we receive from, from people in our community. Um, so two ways that you can give to Grace Point. You can text the word GIVE to 77977. Um, or you can go to our website, which is gracepoint.net slash give, and you're able to contribute there as well. That is going to be all on the screen, so you don't have to remember, remember that. But thank you so much for being with us today. Enjoy the rest of the service. The sun will rise, the sun will rise, bringing life to the earth as it springs from the ground. The sun will rise, the sun will rise. Won't you dry all your tears, lay your burden down? Won't you dry all your tears, lay your burden down?
Good morning, Grace Point. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. It is so good to see you. It is Easter Sunday. Um, and for a Christian community, Easter is like our Super Bowl. I often tell people that for a, like a Jesus community, Easter is like our Christmas, right? Because Christmas is this cultural event um, that has all these expectations. And people tend to associate Christianity with Christmas, obviously. But really like the central event of the Christian tradition, the event that everything springs from, the reason um, we even know that Jesus ever existed is because of whatever this thing called Easter was. Uh, and so I, I want to tell you a story today, one of my favorite stories of uh, post-resurrection appearance of Jesus. But before we do that, I thought it might be helpful. I think when we think about Easter, um, many times we don't really know what to do with it, especially as our faith has shifted and changed. What do we do with Easter? Because growing up, if you would have asked me, what does Easter mean? It would be like, well, Jesus died and came back to life. So like, that's what we do. We die and come back to life. Like if we believe the right things, we'll go to heaven when we die. That's the Easter story. It's actually not the Easter story. The Easter story is actually something much bigger and actually something much more um, uh, incredible than that. So I just want to give you a few thoughts about what, what could we say if somebody were to say to you, as a progressive Christian, what does Easter mean? Um, these are a few things that, that I've found to be meaningful and helpful, and I hope you will too. So first, I would say Easter means this. It means that God has vindicated Jesus. And, and to put that a little more plainly, if the cross, as we talked about last week, if the cross was the empire's no, Jesus presents a vision of a world, a world of justice and peace and compassion and equity. Jesus presents this vision for the world. The empire says no, and they nail him to a cross. Easter is then God saying yes. Easter is God affirming and vindicating the vision of Jesus. This actually is how the world should be. The world should be a place of justice and peace and compassion and equity. That Jesus' message that he embodied even up to death on the cross, that that message is the better way for the world to be run. So God vindic has vindicated Jesus. God has sided with Jesus against the empire. A second, I think we can say that means that Jesus isn't a figure of the past, but Jesus is a figure of the present. On that first Easter uh, and, and after that, Jesus' first followers experienced him in some way. And there are all sorts of different stories in the gospels about those experiences. None of them line up. You cannot put all the details together and make one story. But I think that's the point, that however these first Christians experienced the risen Christ, it defied their boundaries and it defied their categories. And so these first Christians experienced Jesus, not just this Jesus they had known and that had died, they experienced him in another way as being actually alive and present among them. I think we can say that for Christians, Jesus has been taken into the very meaning of God. And I think this is where a lot of the divine language for Jesus comes from, is that Jesus' first followers realized that Jesus' life was of such significance that when Jesus, and actually the language of the New Testament is not actually that Jesus was resurrected. The language of the New Testament is that Jesus was raised up. That's actually what they're saying in the New Testament. Not that he was resurrected, but that he was raised up. And that somehow the meaning of Jesus' life has been taken into the meaning of God. So that when we talk about what Jesus was like, we're talking about God. And when we talk about what God is like, we're talking about Jesus. And I think one of the central, and maybe the earliest Christian creed was just three words, Jesus is Lord. For Christians, the, the earliest Christians especially who were living in Caesar's empire, Caesar was Lord. And so the claim for Jesus is Lord, the claim of resurrection, I mean, think about this. If you're Caesar, you're the most powerful human being in the world, and you killed this guy, and you couldn't even do that right. Right, like Jesus is Lord. Jesus has been raised up. Jesus has, the message and mission of Jesus has transcended even the worst that the empire could do to him. And that shaped how Christians began their movement. It shaped how they lived and engaged the world together. So I hope that's helpful. And I would love to jump into some more conversation around that as we move forward in the weeks ahead, if that's interesting. But today I want to talk about one of my favorite resurrection accounts, and it's found in John chapter 21. And what I find really interesting about this text is it really seems that the gospel of John ended originally in chapter 20. It's kind of put a nice neat bow on it and the story's over. And then in John 21, we have another story. And what scholars generally believe is that this story was added later by some scribe who was maybe making a copy of the Gospel of John. And this scribe had this story 
realized that this particular version, this particular uh, Easter story had not been added to a gospel. And it seems that they really tried hard to make it blend in. They added some content. They tried to stitch it together in a way that it makes it seem like it flows with John's story. But there's a couple reasons we think it doesn't. One is that when they meet Jesus um, in this story, it's like they didn't know he had been raised up. There was, there, it's like they're seeing him for the first time. Um, but this story takes place in Galilee. And it seems what has happened is that the first followers of Jesus who were from Galilee have returned home after everything that happened in Jerusalem. One of the things that scholars universally agree on, pretty much of all stripes, is that Jesus' closest friends and followers abandoned him when he was arrested, that they all fled. Um, and it's very likely that when Jesus was executed, Jesus died with none of his closest friends around him because they knew that if they stuck around town, that they would meet the same fate. And so one of the things that gives them a great deal of confidence that something happened with Jesus, that something happened with these first Christians, is that the Gospels universally tell us that these people abandoned Jesus. And if you're going to start a movement and you want the leaders of this movement to be taken seriously, you don't begin with, and when everything counted, they all ran away and hid. But that's what happens in the gospel stories. And it seems like this is one of those stories. The, the disciples, there were seven of them in this particular account. They have returned back home to Galilee. They've returned back to the spot where they first met Jesus. And, and I just imagine what they were experiencing in those moments. When they came home and they're beside the same lake and they're, they're engaging with one another and remembering that when Jesus showed up to town and invited them to leave their fishing nets behind and to come follow him, and instead of fishing for fish, he would fish, they would fish for people. Like those memories and moments when it seemed like everything was going the way it should be, the moment when they, they felt like the kingdom of God was coming on earth as it is in heaven, the moment when all of their hopes and dreams were in front of them, and now they're back home. And they're back home and Jesus has died. And not only has Jesus died, but they abandoned him when it mattered most. And one of the, the figure that takes center story in this particular Easter account is a guy named Simon Peter, who it was well known. He's one of the leaders of the apostles, one of the leaders of the disciples, uh, Jesus' first group. And if, if we take a quick scan of his story as told through the lens of John, it becomes really interesting. And, and we can maybe get a, a little bit of a, a sense of how he might be feeling on this morning when we meet him on the beach. Uh, in John 13, there's this encounter. They're in the upper room. Jesus is preparing them for his departure. And Simon Peter said to him, John 13, 36, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. If you fast forward to John 18 in the garden, Jesus is arrested. And again, Simon Peter pulls out a sword and starts hacking at the people who are arresting Jesus. And later in that same chapter, Peter denies knowing Jesus three times before the rooster crows. For all his bluster and all his boasting, here he is, he's not dying with Jesus He's denying even knowing who he is. He's, he's sort of like mission impossible, disavowing any knowledge of who Jesus is. Listen to this line from John 18. A servant of the high priest, a relative of one of those whose ear Peter had cut off, because when he pulls out a sword, he cuts off a guy's ear. Um, he said to him, didn't I see you in the garden with him? Right? I, I'm pretty sure you're with him. Peter denied it again, and immediately a rooster crowed. I mean, imagine that moment the moment when you, all of your bluster and all of your bragging and all of your I would, I'm gonna do it, I'm, you can count on me, all of that falls flat and you realize that you haven't done that, that you've actually failed, you haven't lived up to your commitment. I, I bet we've all experienced that eating of our own words, right? We all do it in all sorts of ways. Let me give you a couple examples. When I was not a parent, one of the things that always happened is we'd be out and somebody's kid would be losing their mind. And I would, Carla, I would look at Carla and be like, well, when we're parents, our kids, let me tell you what, that did not happen. Do not say that because here's what happened to me. Our kids are doing all of the same things we said that our kids would never do right? Oh, our kids, we're only going to eat this, this, and this. No, nope, because our kids, are, they just rummage and go wild. Like you just, you, you make lots of claims about what you'll do, and then you're in the moment. Um, we were planning uh, to take a vacation over spring break, and um, 
my uh, wife is going to drive her van, and my, my mother-in-law wanted us to drive her van. But I was going to have to drive the van, and I didn't want to drive the van. I wanted to take my car. And I made a very principled stand that I'm going to drive my car. And then this past week, I hit a kitchen sink that was in the middle of the road on the interstate. Yes, not a sinkhole not a pothole, a full, full grown, is that the language you use for such a thing? A full grown kitchen sink in the middle of the road. And so um, we, I hit this thing, rip out the front part of my car, and then there's the moment where I realize I'm, I'm gonna have to make this phone call where I say, can we please drive your van? Like, I think we all know those funny moments, light moments, but also really serious moments where we've made some pretty bold claims and those claims fall flat. We, we don't live up to them. And I imagine that in this moment, we, we could be all judgy towards Simon Peter, like, how dare you? Like, oh, it's Jesus, right? Of course you stand with Jesus. I, I don't think we can be judgy because we all know exactly what he's experiencing. And I'm sure it's a host of emotions, things like guilt, shame, embarrassment, and grief. I'm sure he'll never hear a rooster crow again without remembering that moment when all of his failure came rushing in on him. But he also remembered those moments, like he left the family business. He told his dad, bye, I'm gonna follow this guy. We're gonna go do this thing and it's gonna change the world. We're gonna announce the dawning of a new age and everything is about to change. Seemed like the kingdom was gonna arrive at any moment. He has so much to process. And I bet all of that was knocking around in his head and heart when Peter made the announcement on this particular day, I'm going fishing. And when he says, like, this is not like, hey, it's a nice day. Let's go fishing, right? This is not for sport. This is for survival. This is what he did. He's gone back to what he did before. He's come home a failure. And he's going to go back to what he knew best. He's going to go fishing. And really, this is about returning to normal. Right? Jesus is dead. The movement has, is dead. It's whatever that new thing was going to be that we were going to do together, whatever that new world we were going to build together that he and Jesus and the other disciples were, were bringing into existence, that's all over now. And so he's decided to go home and do the only thing he knows how to do, get on a boat, and cast his nets, and make a living. And here's the story in John 21. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught Nothing. I don't know if any of you have ever been, I don't, been fishermen. I don't know what the language, fisher person, I don't know what the language is. If you've ever gone fishing, like I'm one of those people who I, I actually enjoy kind of going out in the whole process until you have to actually take the fish off the hook. The thing is, I never really ever have to do that because I never catch anything. I can, I'll go with people and I'm sitting beside them and they are hauling them in hand over fist. And so they'll trade me spots because they feel sorry for me and nothing. You know that frustration, like maybe you don't, but there's a frustration there when you're doing all the right things and the fish just aren't biting. In this moment, they've spent all night, like just going to go back to normal. Let's go back to the thing we know how to do. There's some comfort in that. There'll be some normalcy in that and they catch nothing. And just after daybreak, Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? And I don't know why I want to read that in a British accent every single time. You have no fish, have you? Um, they answered him, no. And he said to them, well, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you'll find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and he jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging a net full of fish, and they were not far from land, about 100 yards. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread, because Jesus had apparently caught some fish. And he said to them, bring some of the fish you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them, um, People, um, if you're wondering, there are lots of people who say lots of different things about the number, but nobody really has a, a very convincing uh, guess. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This is now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he's raised from the dead. That third time is one of the scenes where the author is trying to, but it's clear in this story, they haven't seen Jesus post cross before. 
Uh, they're, they're still operating under the assumption that the movement's over, that Jesus is gone, that he's another would-be failed Messiah figure. And this had to be an overwhelming moment. Almost one of those moments, like if, if you wake up early in the morning and your eyes are just sort of doing that thing where they're not really focusing and you have to rub them a bit to, see, to make out whatever it is you're looking at. It's that sort of, they've been fishing all night. They've caught nothing. I bet they're tired. I bet they're frustrated. And now it's this, oh, they, they look ahead and there's this figure on the beach. And they can sort of, he, he looks familiar, but in the same time, he looks unfamiliar. There's a, there's a familiarity about an unfamiliar figure, right? They don't ask him who he is because somehow there's a resonance. They know who he is. One minute they're fishing with no luck, and the next minute they're having brunch on the beach. Now, this whole line, there, there's this really interesting line in here that when I started preparing this message a few weeks ago, um, I, I noticed this line. I never really paid attention to it before, but there's this line that they're on the boat fishing. They pull in the fish. The one disciple says, hey, that's the Lord. And what is Simon Peter's first response? It says he puts on some clothes because he's naked, which is, just seems like a, a, a weird story in and of itself. And he jumps in the water. This is like reverse skinny dipping, right? Like he's, he's fishing naked and he puts on clothes to jump in the water. And it just seems like, a really strange story. But one of the things about, yeah, this story has been put in here probably, but the author went to great lengths to make it fit in with the Gospel of John. So for just a minute, let's imagine the Gospel of John is this John 1 to 21, a seamless unit. And if you think about how John begins the story, John begins the Gospel, John 1, 1, in the beginning. Now, that's a throwback to the very first sentence of the Bible in the book of Genesis. In the beginning. So it seems like what John is doing, and maybe the whole reason that this detail is added into this text is because there's this throwback to the Genesis story. Right? John's gospel is telling a story of new creation. Something new is happening right within the old. And here we come to the final story in the gospel, John 21. And there's a story about somebody being naked and having to cover up. Does that story ring any bells? The very first human beings eat the forbidden fruit, realize they're naked, and what is their first move? Their first move is to hide. Their first move is to feel shame and to cover themselves from, them, from each other, but to also go into hiding from God. If, if we kind of see this, whatever happened historically, if we actually just try to approach this at sort of the level of meaning or the level of metaphor, um, what might it mean that in this moment, seeing Jesus Simon Peter, who is naked, feels the need to cover up. I mean, we just did the back catalog of his, whatever the opposite of greatest hits are, right? I'll, I'll die with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never deny you. And then he does all of the things he said he wouldn't do. And in this moment, he sees Jesus, and his initial impulse is to cover up in shame, to hide himself. So they come into the beach, and let's pick the story back up. When they'd finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend to my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? I think it's really interesting that there are three denials where, where Simon Peter has three opportunities and he denies knowing Jesus. And now at the end, we come to this beautiful full circle moment where he has three opportunities to affirm his love for Jesus. Do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said it to him the third time, right? The third time, I imagine in, in Peter's brain, he's hearing the rooster crow. Oh. Do you love me? And Peter responds, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fashion a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. And after this, he said to him, follow me. This is obviously written uh, this detail was added into the story very likely after Peter met his death as, uh, at the hands of the Roman emperor, Nero, likely. I imagine like, that moment when Jesus speaks his name, 
Like they're sitting around, they're having breakfast. There's an obvious elephant on the beach. And then he says, Jesus looks up and says to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? I'm sure that moment when he heard his name, he tenses up. He has to be just dreading this moment, the moment where Jesus is now, what's gonna happen? Jesus is gonna really give it to him. He's gonna call him on the carpet. He's gonna, oh, how could you? The moment I needed you, how could you abandon me? How could you deny me? You said all of these things. You were with me to the end, and now look at you. But none of that happens. Instead, Jesus looks at him and asks a question. Do you love me? And the first time he asks, do you love me more than these? And that question has spurred a lot of conversation speculation. What are the these? All right. I really don't think Jesus is trying to create some kind of competition where he says to, to Peter, hey, do you love me more than these other people love me? Prove it. I don't think Jesus is trying to start a competition. Maybe he's talking about fish. Like there's all these fish over here. Do you love me more than these? Do you love me more? And maybe he's saying, do you love me more than going back to the way it was before? Do you love me than going back to your old life, to the thing that was new, the thing that was familiar and not challenging and the thing that you could do in your sleep? Do you, maybe, maybe just maybe, do you love me more than you love going back to your old life? But, but maybe it's not just the fish. Maybe it's what the fish in this situation represent. These fish, all hundred and some of them, are reminders of Simon Peter's failure. He is back on this boat, hauling in this catch because he failed. They were reminders that when it really counted, he couldn't be counted on, that he had bailed on Jesus at the crucial moment. These fish, in so many ways, are symbols of his shame and failure. How, how could he ever look Jesus or any of these other disciples in the eye again? Then Jesus calls him to leave it behind. Do you love me more than these? Okay, then I've got work for you to do. Do you love me more than these? Okay, I've got some sheep that need feeding. Do you love me more than these? I've got some lambs that need tending. There's stuff for you to do in the world. There's work. And I would argue that in this moment, we're learning a powerful truth that the work that Simon Peter actually is being given to do in the world, he couldn't have done it without the failure. That the failure is a critical moment in the process for him. Right, because one of the things that happens when you're tasked with leading, when you're tasked with parent, whatever the thing you're doing, when, when maybe you haven't actually failed catastrophically before, you, you kind of approach it with a lack, you can approach it, not everybody, but some of us can approach it with a real lack of sort of compassion, like just get it right and get it done. But in this moment, Simon Peter will understand how every single human being who's ever failed another human being will feel because he has failed catastrophically. And in this moment, it's almost like Jesus is saying, okay, now you're ready. Before when you were bragging, before when you was like, oh, I'm, I'm in it to win it. Like, yeah, yeah, you weren't ready. Now, in this moment, you're ready. So if you love me more than you love your failure, if you love me more than you love holding on to it and turning it over again and again and beating yourself up about it, if you love me, if you love me then we've got some work for you to do in the world. Jesus is calling him to leave behind that guilt and shame that caused him to want to cover up the minute he saw the risen Christ. Yeah, you, you can stay in that, or you can leave that, and you can go do this work that you've been given to do in the world. It's almost like he's, P- Peter can let this failure shame him and determine who he becomes, or he can listen to the voice that is reminding him that he isn't defined by his failure, no matter how large it was, that shame actually doesn't have to have the last word in his story, that in the midst of the failure, the risen Christ shows up on the beach ready to serve brunch. And he invites Peter just to keep going. I think this is true for us too. I think it's those moments when we think we're done, when we think our failures are final, when we've gone beyond the point of no return, when the shame is so heavy we can barely breathe. Those are the moments if we'll open our eyes and look toward the beach, and it'll be foggy and we may not be able to make it out, but we may see somebody with a fire and some fish and some bread sitting on the beach, inviting us to brunch, asking us, do you love me more than these? Easter reminds us of the tenacity of love, that even when it's dead and buried, love finds a way, that a cross and a tomb cannot keep love away from us, and neither can our failure and guilt or shame. It it is so often that this Jesus story is used to guilt and shame and harm people. 
It's almost like the way we tell the story, the way Christians have told the story for a long time is that when they land on the beach with all the fish, Jesus is standing there shaking his finger saying, how could you? I'm so disappointed in you. That's not the Jesus they meet. The risen Christ isn't angry. (laughs) The risen Christ isn't on a guilt trip. The risen Christ isn't trying to heap shame on them. The risen Christ is simply inviting them to brunch and inviting them to help build a better world. This Easter, may we let this love resurrect us. May we let it transform us. May we let it fill us with all the hope, peace, and joy we've been longing for. May we have eyes to see that in our worst moments, there will always be that familiar figure on the beach inviting us to come, inviting us to eat, inviting us to be seen and known and loved and embraced, not in spite of our failure, but often right in the middle of it because of it. This is where the risen Christ meets us. This Jesus, this is what it means to say Jesus has been raised up. It's to say that love, not guilt, not shame, love has the final word in our story. I've sat by far too long And I've watched the hurting suffer all day chances every day to live like you die to myself and give your love away I wonder why I feel so
Grace Point, thank you again for being with us this morning, especially for those of you joining us from wherever you are in the world for the very first time on this Easter Sunday. We're so thrilled to have you with us. Next Sunday morning, we're gonna begin a brand new series called Bible Stories for Grownups, and we're gonna focus on the synoptic gospels, and we'll talk more about that, but synoptic is just the word that refers to Matthew, Mark, uh, and Luke. And so we're gonna dive into that next week, and we're gonna look at a story where Jesus learns something new and actually changes his mind. It's one of my favorite stories in the Gospels. I hope you'll join us next Sunday for that. Until then, Grace Point, uh, may you go into the world with this resurrected life in you, knowing that you are loved, that failure and mistakes and all of that guilt and shame do not have the final word over you, but love does, and nothing can keep love down. Grace and peace be with you.